I want to share a word that impacted me when I found it maybe two, three weeks ago. Um, I haven't been praying it daily, but that's where I, I want to go. Um, the challenge is I keep thinking, oh, so I so needs to hear this size. Take it down, put it on the office desk so I can mail it off to some of my clients, not all of my clients, just a few that, you know, the hand of God is on for um, sacrificial and worshipful living. So this came out of Chuck Pierce's Facebook. And um, it, when I read it, it just... So um, if you want a copy, let me know and I'll email it to you. This is what it says. The time has begun. You feel the start, the beginning. The soberness of what will happen next is in you this morning. It is now all business. Make all of your plans accordingly. You must be where I need you at all times. Let me guide you and let me direct you. Stay in my spirit. Wait for me to speak. All else must fall to the wayside. I will take care of the fallout. This is a time of such focus. This is a time to heed everything I speak to you. Take nothing lightly. Nothing. Walk in obedience. Walk in my leading. Nothing else matters now. Listen for every nuance of my voice, every urge in your spirit. For surely I'm speaking with my people now. Approach each day ready to hear what is on my heart. Wait for every word I speak that you might walk in tandem with me. Place your hand firmly in mine and do not fear. We will walk this together and all will be well as we do. Challenging at times, yes, but it will be well with you as you look to me for everything. This is not a time to hesitate or a time to doubt. This is not a time to move ahead of me. This is a time to wait, to listen, and to move when I say move. I will make it clear as you settle yourself before me and listen. Don't be afraid to ask, don't be afraid to hear what I ask of you. Don't dread to hear. What I ask, I will give grace for. Fear has no place in what we will do together in days ahead. Don't listen to his voice. Don't let him speak to you. He is trying to, and he will try. Greater am I than he, and he has no power unless you give it to him. Don't. Victory is ahead. It will come. Keep your focus on that when you don't see it right away. It will come. Victory will come. And I think it was three or four weeks ago that Mike said that we were established in the victory in Christ. So from the words that have come forth today, we can see that God has been building week upon week. I think it was maybe a month ago that Avi from Singapore um, had a vision of a horse in a stable being led out. Today the horse is in the, in the house. So um, every, every prophecy that we've been getting week upon week has been building one upon the other. And um, we need to be able to discern. We need to be able to just obey. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. It's so simple. So simple. It's not about how many times we say I love you. It's not even really about the depth of our worship. It is about our obedience. So let me just share before I start the word. I want to share a testimony from somebody who was obedient. Just obedient. Had no idea that God was doing anything. Right? Just did what he felt the Lord was telling him to do and had no idea that uh, God was doing anything behind the scenes. Most of you might have heard of Tim Tebow, the US professional footballer. He's a Christian. He uh, takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of attack for being a Christian, but he is stalwart in his faith. And you know, in American football, I don't know much about it, but they have the, the black under the eyes. Well, he has on his Philippians 4.13, I can do all things not he doesn't have all the wording, but he has Philippians 4 13. But he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. And they had one every, I forget how many years ago this was, 
but they had won every game and now they were in the Nationals. In the Super Bowl, I think, is that the Nationals? So um, they're in the Nationals. And his coach likes things kept in order. So if you win the first game of your season wearing black socks, the next week everybody's still wearing black socks, but they're higher or bigger or thicker or something. Like, you know, black work this time, then black socks will work this time, but we just need to make it a bit, you know. So he was dreading telling his coach that he wanted to um, change the scripture. Because he knew his coach would say, no, this has worked for us all this time and brought us to where we are. You can't change it now. But anyway, he went to his coach and he just said, look, I just really feel if I don't do this, I'm going to be disobedient. And the Lord is asking me to put John 3.16. Oh. And the coach thought about it and then he said, okay. Not, not happy about it, but, but if you feel that's God, okay. Well, they won the Nationals. But do you know what happened? 94 million people Googled John 3.16. Straight after the game or during the game. 94 million. So his response was, I can't believe that many people don't know John 3.16. That was what he thought. But 94 people Googled John 3.16. So he had no idea God was doing anything. But God was at work. Three years later, to the day, there's another football game. And he's still got John 3.16. And they won. So he's heading off to do the media um, interview thing. And he's the PR guy for the whole team stops him and says, Tim, do you know what happened? And he went, yeah, 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 we won. You know, like I've got to go and speak to the media. He says, no, 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 no. Do you know what happened? And he went, look, I want to go, no. He said, no, you need to know what happened. And he said, well, what happened? And he said, three years ago to this day, you changed that under your eye to John 3.16. Today, three years after today, you threw the 316 yards. Um, your yards per rush, whatever that means, but your yards per rush were 3.16, yards per completion, 31.6, Time of possession, 31.6. Um, ratings, 31.6. And 90 million people Googled John 3.16. It was the number one thing on social media. And Tim said, God, I didn't know you were doing anything. Wow. So sometimes we can look at our lives and think, God's really not doing much. I'm not making much of an impact on anybody. I really can't see when God's breathing. I really can't see who's being touched. But behind the scenes, God is doing so much more, impacting people because you are the living epistle of Christ, because you are what they see, because Jesus is not walking this earth, you are, because you are the image bearer, because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, because you are intoxicated by the Spirit of God, that you've come under the influence of a Holy Spirit, because you are that living epistle. So everywhere you go, people are looking at you and they're reading you like they would be reading the Bible and you are having an impact on people that you know nothing about but you're going to find out when you go home. Do not despise, you know, don't look at yourself and think, oh, I don't know what God's doing. Don't do that. God uses each and every one of us. Each and every one of you. His hand is on your life for good. You are all called. You've all got different assignments, you've all got different gifts and talents and abilities, but you are all called. You are all the temple of the Holy Spirit. So one of the things that I want to talk about today, Father, I pray that you would give me oh, the tongue of a ready writer, that Father God would be the, the tongue of a disciple, that I would hear from you, that I would speak what you want spoken, that Father, hearts would be impacted, that Father, um, obstructions to the Holy Spirit would be busted yes. down in the name of Jesus, that there would be a freedom to flow of the Holy Spirit yes. in our personal lives that we've never had before, yes. that the limitations that we place upon ourselves would be completely destroyed, and that when we come into a freedom that comes as we flow with the Holy Spirit, Spirit 
heart to spirit with God, as we flow cardiognosis, heart to heart with God, as we know Him by heart. And so we speak right now that as this word comes forth, let it come forth anointed, let it come forth in fire, let it come forth ministered by the angels of God, and let it come forth and change. Because we are to be temples of the Holy Spirit, living under a divine influence that makes you intoxicated with the joy of living. So sometimes we have to tell our faces, I'm actually enjoying myself. Sometimes the people around us aren't too sure. So I just want to talk about the first miracle of Jesus if you want to turn to John chapter 2. Oh, this is this is Ooh. a wild goose Ooh. chase. Oh this is a wild goose chase. <laughs> and Jenny oh. sent Jenny sent this through. I think this is after Wednesday night the wild goose. I love the wild goose. Oh, so good. Thank you. Let me just see. This came from Nat Johnson, Nate Johnson today on um, social media. The thing about pioneering, and that's what we are here, pioneers, apostolic pioneers with a prophetic bent. The thing about pioneering is that when you're actually pioneering, it never feels like it. Instead, it feels like you're wasting, floundering, wandering, and on a wild goose chase. But I heard the Lord say today that the wild goose chase is following the ark following the presence of the Lord. So don't give up or mistake these seasons as a waste or foolish endeavour. The wrestle is on it because the enemy wants you feeling ridiculous so you go back to the safe and sterile path. So pioneers today, surrender to the wild goose chase because you're following the cloud by day and the fire by night. We are on a wild goose chase. So in John chapter 1, I love the book of John. Oh my gosh. You know, they couldn't kill that guy no matter what they did. They tried. They boiled him in oil. They did all sorts of things. They stuck him on an island called Patmos and he writes the book of Revelation. What do you do with a guy like that? What do you do with a guy that you can't kill? Seriously. We need a few of those in Christianity today. A few of those that have poked the enemy for a bit. You can't kill him no matter what you do because his time wasn't up. He was going to go when he was ready to go. And I love that. I absolutely love that. But in the book of John, which is so different to the other Gospels, because they're all about the, the natural side, but John's about the spiritual side. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. In the book of John, in the very first chapter, there are eight titles of God. Eight, sorry, eight titles of Jesus. In the very first chapter of the book of John. Eight titles of our King. They start off John saying, what, well, do you want to know about Jesus? These are the titles. And they're all in the first chapter, eight of them. And they are, because the word, life, light, the sun, the lamb, the Messiah, the king, and the son of man. Starting in verse 1, ending in verse 51. He is the word in verse life, in verse 1. He is the life in verse 4. Jesus is the light in verse 7. Jesus is the Son in verse 8. Jesus is the Lamb in verse 29. Jesus is the Messiah in verse 41. Jesus is the King in verse 49. And Jesus is the Son of Man in verse 51. Jesus. These are the titles of Jesus. John says, you want to know about them? The book of John was written, why? So that you would believe. That's why it was written. It says that in what, John 19, John chapter 20. It says this book was written so that you might believe. And so him that's starting off with, these are eight titles of our king. You want to know who he is? Bam! Right in your face. This is who he is. He's the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Man. He's the Lamb of God. His word, his life, his life. This is who he is. This is so you can believe. And then the very first miracle that he did is in John chapter 2. And I want you to have a think about this. They're at a wedding. What is Jesus coming back for? Where are we heading? We're heading for a wedding, right? Yes. Oh, we're heading for a wedding. Yes. Oh. And so Jesus is at this wedding. And his time had not yet come. Our time has not yet come. Right? See the parallels. But they had run out of wine. 
And sometimes when you look around at the, the, the body of Christ, we seem to run out of wine. Where's the power of God, we say? Where are the miracles of God, we say? We're almost ashamed because we're not demonstrating the power of God. We're not seeing it demonstrated. We don't have to demonstrate it. But there's almost this kind of like, oh my gosh, what's happened? What's happened? Where's the power and the presence gone? And then there were six water pots, stone pots, just filled with water. Or they weren't, they were empty. But six is man. Six is the number of men. And then the stone. And what does this in Ezekiel 36, what does God take us out of us? Hearts of stone. So Jesus is talking here about people. They were pretty ordinary, pretty normal until we connect with Jesus. And then the water becomes the best wine, intoxicating wine, in filling of the Holy Ghost. So when you look at this miracle, it's not yet time that he fills you with the wine, the best wine. So for those of us who have had an infilling of the Holy Spirit, being baptized by the Holy Spirit, <coughs> being immersed in the Holy Spirit, whatever, for those of us, sometimes it feels like I'm about as spiritual as a wet paper bag. Anybody ever felt like that? Sometimes it just seems the anointing. I'm not sure where it went, but I definitely don't feel it around here. Sometimes it's like that. But Jesus, you know, the early church kept getting refilled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, they were praying, and again, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. So they were filled, you know, like again. And sometimes we, we don't realise that there, there might be a crack in the stone jar and the wine leaks out. But you are filled with the finest wine, the Holy Ghost. You fill them out. The challenge is we don't act drunk. We don't live like we're under the influence. I had an uncle who was an alcoholic and it didn't matter what time of the day, what time of the night, he knew where his bottles of grog were. And he was pretty sloshed most of the time. And he was always waiting for the pub to open. He was there until the pub closed. And then he was home and it didn't matter whether it was breakfast or lunch. His, his, his alcohol. He was addicted. Like he was he was an alcoholic. If we can draw a parallel to the spiritual, how addicted are we to the presence of the Holy Spirit? How addicted are we? Or to the presence of the Lord? Do you crave him? Can you not wait till the next fix? We've got, to, we've got to actually yield to the intoxicating effect of the wine of God, the Holy Spirit. A lot of times we don't yield because what well, just doesn't seem proper or right, or whatever. And so we have these, oh no. And, and you know, how many times do we have to have this argument, God, is that you or is that me? Like, I revert to that, when I really don't want to do what he wants me to do. <laughs> God, I'll do anything you want me to do, just need to know it's you. Is that you or is that me? I'm just not sure. We all have little escape clauses that we try to use, which we can't use anymore. But he took these, these stone pots and he said, fill them with water. And then they were touched by Jesus. And then came the best wine. 
You are a temple of the Holy Spirit, filled with the best wine from heaven. You should slosh as you walk, because you're filled with heaven's wine. We have, I, I, there's so many different nationalities in this room, but sometimes our nationality causes us to kind of quench the Holy Spirit. You're very polite. Yeah. That's I'm, right. Right. I'm looking at the faces of these women, but I look at the faces. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians says, chapter 5 says, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't put the fire out. Don't put the fire out. Don't put the fire out. Don't quench it. We're told in Ephesians we can grieve him. Now the number of times, oh, Holy Spirit. Yes. I'm so sorry I grieved you. So we're coming into a season where we have to actually live under the intoxicating effect of the Holy Spirit and just go with the flow. Whatever that looks like. It will be love because the Holy Spirit fills us with the love of God. <coughs> but we are to be intoxicated, right? Intoxicated. You know when babies get intoxicated by the milk and they get that little milk drunk kind of look on their face like, oh my. <laughs> you know, they get that look. You know, babies get it when they've had so much milk that they can't fit any more in so. We need to be like that. Come on. You know, but we, we sometimes think, well, it's not proper, it's not right, uh, it's not acceptable in my, my job, it's not acceptable in my church. You know, it should be only doing what's acceptable in heaven. Right? What's acceptable in heaven. And it's okay in heaven to get absolutely intoxicated and drunk by the Spirit of God and be, and just go with the flow with him and allow him to direct you. We've got to be addicted yeah. to his presence. We've got to allow the wine of heaven to, 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 uh, to just flow. It's just intoxicating. You know, when you take communion, allow the intoxication of the wine of heaven to flow through your veins. Like, absolutely get some joy. You know, get some joy. People are happy drunks. If they're cracky drunks, it's not heavenly wine. But they're happy. And we've got, you know, so Jesus is saying here, I'm, I'm, I'm at a wedding, but my time is not quite yet ready. And I, but I'm ready to fool them with wine, even though I shouldn't be doing it yet. My time's not here, Mum. But she said, whatever he says, do it. And so he filled them. These, these stone pots, water pots, mm. fill them to the full. And then they became the best wine. So good that, you know, wow. The best wine's always given at the first, but then you're giving it at the last, and everybody's so drunk with another wine, they don't even know what it is. But honestly, where have we, where have we reached the point where we hinder the Holy Spirit? But we're not sure what he wants. We're not free to flow because we're scared of what people are going to say or how it's going to look or what's going to be the fallout. Like, who gives a whip? You either please God or you don't. You either please him or you don't. And so this is the wine. This is the intoxication of the wine. Crave him. Crave him. Let him fill you up so that you are overflowing. And you know, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not so much about speaking in tongues. That's a lovely bit of icing on the cake. It's about the power of God demonstrating yes. through your life. He says that people yes. know you're a witness to Jesus everywhere you go. That when you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive power, dunamis power. And you'll be a witness for Jesus everywhere you go. Allow the Holy Spirit to do his job. Get you drunk. Shelly, you know what that's like. You came out of that. I mean, it was years ago. I didn't even came out of it. 
you know what I'm talking about. Well, you know what it's like, right? And you need to go back to it. Stir up the people at your Bible study. <laughs> so, you know, but it's, 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 it's amazing. You stop and think about it when you're you, you have been filled with heaven's wine. Filled with it. Another take on it is the new wine skin, the old wine skin. Right? So if you want to turn, am I making sense? Yeah. And it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, that we are an earthen vessel carrying an amazing treasure. Holy Spirit. But in Matthew chapter 9, verse 17, it talks about wineskins. King James says, follows. But wineskins. Get, get a thing on the word skins. Chapter 9, verse 17, he says, Neither is new wine put in old wineskins. For if it is, the skins burst and are torn in pieces, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are ruined. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. So he's talking about wineskins. So back in the day, it was actually goats that they would actually use goat skin that sew up the legs. And they would use the net for pouring in the liquid or drinking out of it, and it would be sealed, you know, tied with laces and sealed. So they're talking about skins. But what are we? Skins. Yeah. Right? And we've been to carry the new wine. We've got to become a new wine skin. If you are an old wine skin, the only thing that, that would change the old wine skin into a new one, they would have to rub it in salt and, and, and let soak it in water. But rubbing it in salt was bacteria, got rid of any bacteria that was on it. Soaking it in water made it soft. And then they massaged oil into it so that the skin would soften up. So, you know, so it doesn't matter how old we've been in the Lord. Our old wine skin can always become a new wine skin that can hold the new wine. You've got to recognize that you're a new wine skin and you're carrying new wine, okay? You're moving in the fresh flow of the Holy Ghost. He wants you absolutely filled and flourished and intoxicated and surrendered and moving with Him in the things of God, the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, all of the amazing things of the Holy Spirit. But you carry Him. Why are we so quiet about it? And when I was born again, I've got two questions that were asked. Are you born again and are you filled with the Spirit? That was all that mattered. Are you born again? Have you been filled with the Spirit? Nothing else mattered. If you haven't been filled with the Spirit, everybody would lay their hands on your head and practically rub your head raw until you were speaking in tongues and baptized in the Holy Ghost. It was just like so paramount. It had to be. You've got to, you've got to be filled with the Spirit. You need to be filled with the Spirit. And when you're filled with the Spirit, you're just going to love everybody. Yeah. Well, when you're filled cool. with the Spirit, you're going you're gonna to move, you're going to see things, miracles will happen, signs and wonders will follow. When you're filled with the Spirit, you're baptized Ooh. in the Holy Ghost. Wow. And so we've got this amazing, like, you know, like we, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, filled with His presence, and this is filled with the new wine. You are a new wine skin. And so there are some things that can happen that can crack skins when they get a bit old. Let me tell you what can crack some of our skins. Vexations. Anybody ever get so vexed that you just want to slap somebody? Am I the only one? Probably. Vexations, frustrations, anxieties, worries, bitterness, envy, jealousy, selfishness, sin, they all form cracks in the wine skin. They harden the wine skin. They make it incapable of carrying the new wine. But you're a new wine skin. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're a new wine skin filled with new wine. Filled with new wine. Old wine has gone. This is a completely different season, different time. Things that are happening around the world, Asbury revival. Please God that it continue, pull it up pure and free. Yes. It's moving on to other college campuses. Uh, there's been some spontaneous worship in Times Square. Please God, Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 
This yep. came to me. Asbury, Durant, Jackson, Georgia, still plays very well with like now. Jackson, Georgia High School, Sea Lord University, Ohio Christian University, Lee University, back to Austin, Texas, Parker, Missouri, Indiana University, Wesleyan, the Gate, Charlotte, North Carolina, King Way, Vernon, Alabama, Kingdom Life, Waterville, Miami, Israel, Uganda, University of Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky, Kentucky Christian, and Christ for All Nations, Dallas, Texas. So, But you know what's happened? They started to linger in the presence of God. Yes. They started to linger. They started to say, God, I just want you. I just want to worship you. And as they worshipped you, and as they, as they, maybe the prayer meeting came to an end, some of them walked out, but then they came back. Because we're just so hungry for the presence of God. Because nothing else matters but being in his presence. Nothing else matters but breathing with him and being in step with him. And living that lifestyle of John 5, 19, where Jesus said, I only ever do the things my father tells me to do. And John 5, 20. The Father says, I delight to show my son what I'm doing. He delights to show you what he's doing. And so there's this, this, this move of the Spirit, considering everything else that's happening, the earthquake in Turkey and the, uh, the train wrecks in America and, and all of the things that are happening around the world in Auckland and New Zealand and all of that. There's this move of God coming against the darkness. But we want to move with it. Well, you can't move with it if you're an old wine skin. And you can't move with it if you're, if you're on old wine. You can't move with it. This is a new thing. So everything you think you know that's done any good, listen, let the Holy Spirit orchestrate in you what needs to come out of you. Don't you go thinking. Don't you go working it out logically. Don't you go doing that in your mind because you're sent into the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and it won't be at the tree of life. You flow with the Spirit. It's all about cardiognosis. It's all about heart-to-heart -heart knowledge. It's about flowing with Him, listening to Him, listening Living with him, loving him. And if he wants you to, to soar in the, in, the, in the spiritual realm and protect the earth and be an earth steward, do that. Whatever it is he's called you to do. But don't compare yourself with anybody else. Don't think, well, nobody else is doing what I'm doing because every, God's got an individual thing for everybody. But you've got to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. You've got to be intoxicated with the new wine. There's a, there's a way of flowing with him so that he can move you in the gifts in any way he wants, that so he can have the fruit flowing out of you in every situation where it's needed. There is a, a move of, he's so hungry to have a, a group of people who will align with him, yes. who will engage with him. Yes. Sonship, yes. legacy, yes. engagement. The Holy Spirit is looking for this. Yes. You know, and, and we, we, can't, we can't keep coming to church thinking it's always going to be like this because it's not. It's not. There's going to be times that we all ascend together and we carry out an assignment in the heavenlies. On Thursday at the business prayer meeting, you know, there was a, a small group of us there and the Lord said to us, I want you to ascend. And some of us learned from open heaven. I was like, well, okay. But we ascended and we actually prayed about the recession, the inflation for this nation. We repented of... Um, of the way Australia has managed its resources and what governments have done. Closing down manufacturing, sending things off to other nations, not looking after its own people. We, there was so much we repented of. And then we asked for the mercies of God that we would not come under the consequences or, or the, the effects of man's... We want to come under the hands of God for change, yeah. not man. We don't want to come under government or man. I can't think of the word. But we want we want that. If David was given the choice of being assaulted by the enemies or more by God, he took God. We want God. Yeah. And so it was basically saying, God for this nation, Jesus is our jubilee. Yeah. Jesus is our jubilee. We recognize that there will be a little bit of turmoil as things are sorted out, as you bring things into divine order. But we would rather come under your hand than the hand of man. And that was our assignment on Thursday at the business prayer meeting. Yeah, so there will be times when we come together here on Sunday and 
there will be assignments. There will be other times when maybe you won't turn up at church because God's going to do an assignment. But what you have more than anything else, let me tell you what's important, what I, is that you must nurture your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Nurture it. He is often overlooked. But we need to allow the Holy Spirit to take our relationship with Him where He wants to, where He wants to take it. And for some of us, we like to control things just a little bit too much. We like to feel a little bit safe. And if I'm going to feel safe, then I can't allow this to happen. I'll feel me, but I just need to be safe. God knows what you need better than you know. And I was listening to Myron Golden this week. Oh, I praise God for that man. I was listening to Myron Golden and he said, God always delivers his people into danger to go through it. Like at the Red Sea, you know, like they have to walk through the Red Sea with all these walls of water on either side. They can't see anything holding it back. So God delivers his people through danger to show up his glory. But we want to stay in control. We want to keep it. This is the way it's got to be. This is the way I like it. This is how I feel good about it. And quite frankly, there's no time for that in the spring season. You are the new wine skin. You're going to carry the new wine. You are the new wine skin. It's time to be filled with the new wine. Yes. In, in Ephesians 5, I think it's 18. You know, sometimes we come to church and people say stuff, things happen. I preach things, people get prophecies, whatever it might be. And sometimes we get a little bit agitated. Ever been agitated in church? <laughs> we can call it different things. But basically, when that happens, it's usually God getting under your skin. Yeah. God gets under your skin. Yeah. God gets under the skin of the wine skin. Yeah. God gets under the skin because he's trying to draw our attention to something. Sometimes, you know, we, we get offended by the truth. We get offended by the word. That's okay. Because God is just showing us stuff so that we can change. He loves you too much to leave you where you are. Count it all down. When? Before. Not if, but when. And so recognizing these things, he wants to do an amazing work with you, a dynamic work of the Holy Spirit in and through you. And in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, I think that's right. Don't get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be ever filled and stimulated with the Holy Spirit. With be ever filled. That's the, in the Greek. That is be, be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. Continually being filled. So what happens is when you start to get a little bit agitated at church, what God is wanting to do is He's wanting to expand the wine skin. He's wanting to make more room to bring in more joy, more peace, whatever it might be, but He wants to expand you. He wants to fill you with more of God's presence. He wants to fill you with more of Himself. So there's an expansion coming, but we get a bit agitated and we want to shut the whole thing down because I'm feeling really uncomfortable about this. But the Holy Spirit's doing
we need. What we need more than theology. What we need more than doctrine. It's true experiences and true encounters in the, in the heavenlies. Because that will always be confirmed in the word. That will always be confirmed by theology or doctrine or whatever it might be. But when you've had an experience, when you've had an encounter, you can't be talked about it. Because you know that you know that you know that you know it's true. But if you've got a, a, a head that's been trained in doctrine, you've got a head that's been trained, you know, but this is the truth. I, I know it's the truth. Guess what? You can be talking about that. And so start asking the Father, Father, is it okay with you if I can have the most amazing experiences and encounters in the spirit of life? Show me the constellation. Take me where I've never been before. What have I said now, Camry? It's not good. <laughs> Sometimes I don't know what comes out of my mouth, so I don't know what I've said. new wineskins, that's the word kainos, which means a renewing, a renewing of the quality of the skin. It's, it's, it's a renewing of the, of the actual skin itself, and that's okay. And so what God is wanting to do is he's wanting to see a group of people that are so intoxicated by the Holy Spirit, so on fire, so touched by tongues of fire, so filled with the presence of the Holy Ghost, flowing in gifts as he wants you to move in the gifts, living the fruit of the Spirit, defying the laws of the natural realm, They're making things impossible possible. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. You are washed by the washing of the water of the Word, but you're also washed by the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. And you can no longer afford to ignore the Holy Spirit. You can no longer afford to not obey his annoyances, his little nudges, his quiet things, because he's got a little voice. And he's a gentle man. He's powerful, but he's, he's a gentle man. So if he asks you to do something and you say no, he steps back. And he'll let you go your own way. And then we wonder why our Christianity is powerless. And why nothing really changes for us and why our prayers aren't answered. Could it be disobedience to the Holy Spirit who is the governor of God upon the earth? He is the governor of the kingdom of God upon this earth. And he's been so gracious with us. Well, most of us have been like fumbling around trying to figure out what's going on. He's been so gracious with us, but I tell you, coming into a time where your relationship with the Holy Spirit is going to be more important than you've ever known it to be before. When you're going to have to flow with Him like you've never flown with the Holy Spirit, you've flowed with the Holy Spirit before. Because He's doing something and He needs new wine skins, which means we have to change, which means we have to break down strongholds, we have to break limitations. We have to stop thinking it's going to be this way or that way. We're going to have to move with the Holy Spirit and allow the mind of Christ to actually take over our mind so that we flow with the wisdom of God. We, instead of saying, no, Holy Spirit, and not even realizing it's the Holy Spirit, that he's coming in power and he's yeah. coming in might for a nation. Yes. And we're either going to be with him or we're going to be against him because with the Holy Spirit, it's one or the other. He does not recognize Switzerland. He does not recognize a peace treaty. He does not recognize a neutral place. You're either flowing with him or you're not. And we don't know the Holy Spirit. You know, we don't really know the Holy Spirit. Do you understand how many? I've got over 200 titles of the Holy Spirit. 268, I think, at the present moment. Titles of the Holy Spirit from the Word of God. We've got to know him. We've got to know when to ask for the spirit of judgment or the spirit of burning. When to ask, okay, is this the time for a spirit of war? Mm -hmm. Or is this the time for a spirit of life, for a spirit of truth, for a spirit of intercession? 
spirit of knowledge, spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, spirit of counsel. There's so many different titles. And if we're not understanding of his position in the kingdom, we can't flow in honour. honor for the king and for his spirit. We have to. The Holy Spirit is wanting a people that yield and allow him to fill them and intoxicate them with the joy of living, with power, with might, with whatever is needed, but to come under his influence in such a way that there is no doubt that there is a God who is all powerful. Pray in the Spirit more than you ever have before. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Worship in the Spirit. He is amazing. He is amazing. I cannot... You know, every time you see, he can be wind or fire or oil. He can swirl through our atmosphere. He can nudge us. He can prepare people's hearts to receive the word we bring. There's no limit to what he can do. But we limit our relationship with him. He is so wonderful. So wonderful. That he's the only one of the Godhead that carries the unforgivable sin. But if you crave him, you'll never, you'll never blaspheme him. You want to know Jesus? Holy Spirit's the one. He said, I'll take everything that Jesus tells me and I'll give it to you. Holy Spirit is amazing. And if you are his temple, do you know how amazing that is? You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're the new wine skin filled with new wine. Your heart has been removed, that heart of flesh, that stony heart's gone. And now you've got a new a heart within you that's full of the wine of the Holy Spirit. Because in Romans 5, 5, the Holy Spirit just pours into your heart and releases the love of God to flow into your heart. So if we're never looking for our own love and bridges to know the Holy Spirit to know. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. He is powerful, militant, loving, gentle, He's the spirit of prayer. He's the spirit of God. The spirit of Christ. Holy Spirit. Holy. 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 Holy Spirit. Spirit of judgment. Spirit of burning. Spirit of intercession. Spirit of love. It's all Holy Spirit. Sevenfold spirits of God. The spirit of the Lord rests upon you, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, the Holy Spirit. And so there are areas in each one of our lives where we hinder the intoxication, the, the move, we, we hinder our, our yielding to the Holy Spirit. Whether we 
with my God. Seeing more, whether we're just, oh, I don't want to look like an idiot. I don't want to do something that I'm going to regret. You know, I'm sure the Holy Spirit will never embarrass you. He will never embarrass you. He will never force his will upon you. Although, he might drive you. Because he drove Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. In one gospel it says, and in another gospel, he drove Jesus into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. We need to allow him to do what he wants to do in our lives. We need to be influenced, come under his influence. Spirit, soul, and body. And part of that is when you were born again, this is something that we're not ever really told. In Genesis, in Exodus 31, you know, we're often taught that the Holy Spirit didn't fill anybody until after the cross. But in Exodus 31, there's Bezalel. Bless you, Bezalel. He filled Bezalel. He said oh, in Exodus 31, uh, 2, I have called my name Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and ability and understanding and intelligence and knowledge and in all kinds of craftsmanship to devise skillful works. And it goes on like that. So Bezalel was filled in order to fulfill his destiny. You are filled with God for the call of God upon your life. What he did for Bezalel, he'll do for you. And he was filled before the cross. He was filled before Pentecost. So, you know, look, again, you know, we put the Holy Spirit in a box where he doesn't fill anybody until Pentecost. No, he filled others in the Old Testament as well. Turn over to 2 Samuel, chapter 10. This is Saul. Verse 7. No, it must be 1 Samuel. Yeah. 1 Samuel. Chapter 10, verse 6. The Spirit of the Lord, this is the prophecy. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily, and you'll show yourself to be a prophet with them, and you will be turned into another man. So when we get filled with the Holy Spirit and we learn to surrender to Him, we actually become different people. Who wants to be different? Yes. Aren't we all crying out to be transformed, to be made more like Christ, to be more yes. fruitful, to live more like the fruit of the Spirit? Yes. This is when the Holy Spirit will come upon you, you're going to be turned into another man. Yes. And down in, um, in verse 10, when they came to the hill, behold, a band of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came mightily upon him, and he spoke. Saul spoke under divine inspiration. You know, I've gone through my Bible, and anything that relates to the Holy Spirit, I've colored in blue. And it is on so many pages in the Bible, even in books where the Holy Spirit is not mentioned, that there is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, whether it's fire or wind or flame or oil or whatever it might be, or breath. There is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. And we talk about going around Jericho and hell out of quiet. But when they blew their trumpets and when they yelled in one voice, you know, the, the walls came down. Let me tell you, it wasn't the sound of the trumpets, although that was important. It wasn't the sound of their voices, although that was important. What was important was that the breath of the Holy Spirit that filled their lungs and came out as they roared and filled the trumpets as they blew. It was the Holy Spirit. They had to yield, they had to blow the trumpets, they had to yield, but it was the Holy Spirit. We have to yield. We have to learn how to yield more. And he'll teach us. Ask him to take you into the school of the Spirit. Ask him, because then he'll teach you how to ascend. He'll teach you how to move in the Spirit realm. He'll show you things in the constellation you've never seen before, but ask him, take me, Holy Spirit, into the school of the Spirit and teach me what my Father wants me to know. And if you pray that prayer, you will be taught differently. Louisa, you won't be taught the same thing as Karen. Karen, you won't be taught the same thing as Carol. 
Caroline, you won't be taught the same thing as Gwyn. Every one of us will be taught something different because the Father has a different plan and purpose for each of our lives and he wants us to have the knowledge that he wants us to have. And we go around like a, like a scattergun at a smorgasbord and we'll say, I'll have a bit of this and I'll have a bit of that and I'll have a bit of this. And the Holy Spirit's saying, if I could just get you laser focused, <laughs> if I could just get you to concentrate on one course at a time, it's not a smorgasbord. There is one course at a time. Come to that one thing that I've called you to and you'll get enough revelation out of that, enough life out of that, enough power out of that so you get everything you need for where you are right now. When you finish partaking of that meal, I'll move you on to the next. But while you go smorgasbording from one ministry to another, from one thing to another, from me from one book to another, while you go smorgasbording, the power of the Holy Spirit is diluted. And you are not being filled with the knowledge and the truth the Father wants you to have. You're filling it with what your head says you need to have. So I love reading. You know how I love reading. I have a whole one box of the new ones that are coming in. And but I've been so convicted. Then now I sit there and I say, okay, what is it you want me to read right now because I'm in your school? What is it the Father wants me to know right now? I will not be distracted by anything else. What is the one thing he wants me to know? It's making it flesh. Oh! It's got to become flesh. It's got to become flesh in you. Oh, sorry. Oh. And if it, if it doesn't, we're not as powerful, we're not as strong. God will always be powerful and strong. And he can use a donkey and he can make a rooster crow and he can beat Peter and he can do all sorts of things. But he's looking for sons to manifest so that creation is put to rest. This creation is growing the manifestation of the sons of God. So he's looking for sons. Slash all the sons. That will put creation to peace. Yeah. So you've got a choice of how much you allow the word of God to possess you. Yeah. It's your choice. It'll either be a logos, it'll be a rhema, or it'll be manifest flesh to flesh. Yeah. Meditate the word. Just, just sit with it. Mm. Allow the Holy Spirit to wrap it in your heart, to let it come out of your mouth. But it can't be like a, even just a rhema. A rhema is awesome. It's better than the logos because like every uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And that word is, is rhema. But when, when it actually becomes, when the word becomes flesh in you, it is as Jesus is walking the earth. It is oh, as Jesus. Yes. So you can actually minister as Jesus ministered when he walked the earth because he was a man under the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit as we are. So you, we can have that. You can have the same um, measure of ministry, the same measure. The word can become flesh in you as it did in Jesus because it's the same Holy Spirit that's doing the work. Yeah. But we have to yield to it. We have to hunger for it. We have to want it. And you can no longer be surface value. Don't talk to me about logic and reason because the word of God is all about mysteries. It's all about faith. It's, it's taking things when you don't, I don't understand that God. I don't understand how Christ to me is the hope of glory. Come on, get that. But I receive it by yes. faith. And so I, I will receive the mystery. <coughs> it's receiving the mysteries. And as you walk in the mysteries, you'll find that the power and the presence of God wraps around you like nothing you've ever experienced before. But you accept the mystery. You accept the mystery. You're not trying to sort it out, you're not trying to think it through. There's no way my peanut brain will ever think through anything God has done. It doesn't matter if I have an IQ of a genius. I never will be able to. But I embrace the mysteries. I embrace the mysteries. That's faith. Embracing the mysteries. And as I embrace the mysteries, he'll give me a layer of As I embrace the mystery, the revelation deepens. Mm. And then it deepens again. And it 
and deepens the game to we actually. But none of this works without the Holy Spirit. None of this works without the Holy Spirit. He's the one who gives us the spirit of wisdom and revelation to understand the mysteries. So we have. So as we ask the Holy Spirit to see us where we are, but to take hold of us, to influence us, to bring us under his intoxication, that we would um, be so yielded to the Holy Spirit that he places us in the school of the Spirit and that he teaches each one of us what the Father wants each one of us individually to know and there will be an overlapping for the corporate house but the, the, the important thing is that you know what the Father wants you to know. Don't be sidetracked in this time by ministries, books, CDs, podcasts or anything else that look exciting, look wonderful and look great. Unless you know it's what the Holy Spirit has for you to be involved in. No longer small response. One course at a time. One course at a time. The Holy Spirit is amazing. He is so amazing.